Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and thank you for joining me today and listening to my bad socket puns. Um, I'm Gabby Fisher. I'm a systems engineer at Cloudflare, and I'm really excited to talk to you about sockets in Go. As you might have guessed from my job title, I love computer networking and operating systems. A fun fact about me is that I'm so short, the GopherCon organizers kindly found an Apple box for me to stand on so you can see my face behind the podium. <laughs> This talk was inspired by an occasion where I needed to teach myself about sockets and Go and to fix something at my job. Today, I want to reach out to two audiences. First, those that know about networking but want to learn more about low-level components like sockets. And second, folks who want to learn more about advanced socket usage for Go applications. In this talk, I'll start with the fundamentals of sockets. I'll also talk about the system calls that C programmers use to call into an operating system kernel to open up and use sockets. Then I'll demonstrate how Go makes socket logic easier to implement and use. I'll also talk about a time I needed to modify socket behavior with socket options and how I learned to do this in Go. We'll start with a brief overview of what sockets are in the first place. They're not related to socks, it's too bad. <laughs> Um, you may be familiar with file descriptors. They're used to access input and output resources on computers. And we often encounter them when writing to and reading from files. They're also used to write to and read from networks. File descriptors used to write to and read from a network are called sockets. So sockets are a subset of file descriptors. There are two types of sockets, stream sockets and datagram sockets. Let's first learn about stream sockets, which are used by TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol. TCP maintains a connection state between a server and a client, which guarantees the delivery of packets and their order. I think that setting up and using a stream socket is a lot like setting up and using a phone. So let's apply this analogy as we walk through the syscalls in C that are used to open up and use stream sockets. Let's say our server is represented by a person named Alice, and our client is represented by a person named Bob. First, our server will call socket to create the listening socket that clients can send connection requests to. Calling socket is like Alice procuring a phone so Bob can call her. Next, the server calls bind. The bind syscall binds a socket to an address. A server employs the syscall to bind a socket to an IP port pair so that clients can locate the socket. In the phone analogy, this is like Alice getting a SIM card for her phone so she has a number that Bob can call her at. Now, the server calls listen to allow its stream socket to accept incoming connections from client sockets. To continue our phone analogy, calling listen is like Alice turning on her phone so she can receive, Bob, Bob, receive Bob's phone call when he calls her. Next, the server calls accept. Accept won't actually do anything until a client connects to this socket. Instead, it blocks and waits until the client sends a connection request. So following our analogy, Alice is waiting by her phone for Bob or our client to call. Now that our server is ready to handle inbound connections, let's cover how a client establishes a connection with a server. For a client to connect to a server, it'll first call socket itself. Once the client gets a socket from calling the socket syscall, it calls connect to connect to the server at the address the server is bound to. These client syscalls are like Bob getting a phone for himself and calling Alice at her number. Now that a client has connected to the server, the server will unblock on accept and a connection will be made. A key point to understand about accept is that it creates a new socket for this individual connection between server and client. The listening socket the server created at the beginning of this process remains open and can be used to accept further connections. Both the client and the server can now write data to and read data from their respective sockets using the read and write system calls. Returning to our phone analogy, the creation of a connection is like Alice picking up her phone when Bob calls. 
They now have a one-to-one -one phone call set up and can have a conversation over their phones. When the server and the client are done communicating, they both call close to manually terminate their connection and free up the file descriptor that they used for that connection. This is like Alice and Bob both hanging up when their conversation is done. Now that this diagram is complete, you can see all of the syscalls that are used to handle a TCP connection. This is a lot of syscalls, right? There are eight in total. So you can guess that setting up sockets using direct system calls is pretty tricky. Go distills all of these actions into a smaller set of calls. So let's see how streaming sockets are used in Go. Here, I've started some code for a simple TCP echo server. The first thing I do is call net.listen. The net.listen function does many things at once. It creates a socket, binds it to my given address, and listens for inbound TCP connection requests. It also returns a net.tcp listener struct, which we will use for managing our server connections. For my address, I choose port 8080 and don't specify a host in my Go code. This defaults to using the special IP address, internet address any, which binds to all available IP addresses on that machine. This means that any inbound traffic to port 8080 from any network interface on my machine will be sent to this application. Internet address any is a common way to bind and expose a service on a machine. Now, before we go too far, let's make sure to understand what this return TCP listener struct can do for us. The net package's TCP listener struct is quite small and only contains the file descriptor number for our listening server socket. It implements the listener interface shown here, which provides access to the accept and close system calls that we use to manage connections to a server. Typically, socket system calls would involve passing around values like file descriptors. Go, however, abstracts all of the slow-level logic away with the help of the TCP listener struct and the simple-to-use methods of the listener interface. Go's support for declaring methods on struct types allows us to generate um, a TCP server without directly touching socket code once. So going back to our code, we then call accept on our TCP listener struct. We loop over accept, which blocks until it receives a connection request from a client. When a request comes in and accept unblocks, it returns a TCP construct, which wraps a socket for that individual connection between server and client. This code then passes the created TCP construct to a new Go routine running handle connection. This allows us to handle multiple TCP connections at once. The net package's TCP construct implement the, the net package's con interface and surfaces read, write, and close methods for individual connections. These functions encapsulate the read, write, and connect syscalls I mentioned earlier. There are additional functions in the con interface that implement features like custom timeout logic, but that's a little out of the scope of my talk today. So now that we know what's under the hood of a TCP construct, let's take a look at the handle connection function we use to handle our connections. At a high level, this code echoes messages back to the client. It loops over a TCP stream's packets in 1,024 byte chunks and echoes these chunks back to the client. We use the TCP cons read function to read bytes from the connection into a byte array. This read function abstracts away explicitly maintaining file descriptors or state when reading from the TCP packet. Similarly, the TCP cons um, struct write function is used to write bytes back to our client. Both the server and our client can use the read and write methods to continue sending data to each other. We also call close on this connection struct if an error is returned so we can free the socket's file descriptor for use by another connection if we get one. This is all you need to write a TCP echo server in Go, and take my word for it, the C implementation with direct syscall use is at least twice as long as this. Now that we've covered streaming sockets, let's talk about datagram sockets. This type of socket handles traffic over UDP, or the user datagram protocol. 
Unlike TCP, UDP does not guarantee the delivery of packets or the delivery of packets in order. I find that using UDP is like sending a piece of mail through the postal service. After all, there's no guarantee that letters will arrive in the order that they were sent or even arrive at all. So let's use this analogy to look at the syscalls used for datagram sockets. Again, let's say our server is like a person named Alice and that our client is like a person named Bob. A fair amount of the socket setup for streaming and datagram sockets is the same, so the first few steps I'm about to cover will seem familiar. So first, the server again initially calls the socket syscall to create a listening socket that clients can send datagrams to. This is equivalent to Alice setting up a mailbox that, so Bob can send her mail. In order to allow another application to send it datagrams, the server again calls bind to bind its socket to a well-known address. This is like installing a house number on your mailbox so mail can be addressed and delivered to it. Next, the client creates a socket, or in our analogy, Bob installs a mailbox. Unlike stream sockets, datagram so sockets have no notion of state, so there's no process of setting up a connection before a client sends data to a server. Instead, the client and server can jump straight into sending packets to each other. To send its datagram, a client calls send to, which takes the packet bytes and the destination address of the packet. In order to receive the datagram, the server calls receive from. The server and the client can continue sending datagrams to each other bidirectionally. This is analogous to Bob putting Alice's address on a letter and putting it in the post. Then, when the letter is delivered to Alice's mailbox, Alice goes and opens the mailbox to read the letter. They can continue sending letters to each other in the same fashion. When the socket is no longer ne needed, the server and client both close it using the closed syscall and free up the single file descriptor used to listen for UDP traffic. This is where we kind of have to stretch our mail analogy a little bit. Call and close is like nailing your mailbox shut so no one can send mail from it or receive mail at it. Having looked at syscall, the syscall implementation of a simple UDP socket, um, let's see how datagram sockets are used in Go. Go again abstracts away a lot of these system calls from programmers. I'll go over a simple UDP echo server implementation in Go. Instead of using the listen function, we use listen packet to open up a datagram socket. Like our streaming socket example, I bind to internet address any on port 8080 and to receive all inbound traffic to that port. Listen packet encapsulates the socket and bind syscalls and returns a net.udp construct that we will use to read from and write to the socket. We then pass the UDP construct in the handle packet. But before we dive into what the handle packet function does, let's learn about what the UDP construct can do for us. The net package's UDP construct implements the packetcon interface, which has three functions that might seem familiar. The first instruction function, read from, encapsulates the receive from syscall that we saw earlier. It reads bytes from a packet to a given byte array, and it also returns the source address or return address of this packet so you can send a response to it. The second, write to, writes a go byte array into a packet, which is then sent to the address passed in as an argument. It encapsulates the send to syscall. Finally, a datagram socket can be closed by calling the close function, which calls the close syscall so that no more inbound UDP packets are received. Now that we know what the UDP construct allows us to do, let's dive into the handle packet function. We read packets sent to our socket using the read from function provided by the UDP construct. You can also see that the return to address of the packet sender is stored in another local variable so we know where to send a response to a packet if we have one. To echo bytes back to a client, we use the UDP cons write to function to create and send a packet to the return address we got from calling read from. And finally, if we ever encounter an error reading a packet, we can close the datagram socket. So following this example, we can also see that 
um, Go treats the creation of datagram sockets pretty similarly to its uh, creation of streaming sockets. The language abstracts away the system calls for datagram sockets and fundamentally makes them easier to use and manage. We've now covered stream sockets and datagram sockets as they are represented through system calls and Go. So let's move on to some more complex socket logic. The next section of this talk will focus on more advanced socket behavior, especially interactions between sockets running on the same addresses. An example of an application that needs to run multiple sockets on the same address is a DNS resolver. This is because DNS can run over both TCP and UDP. This may give you some pause. Is it valid to run two sockets on the same address? How does the system know which socket it should forward traffic to if there are two bound to an address? This is where the concept of five tuples for socket matching comes in handy. The five tuple, which consists of the protocol, destination IP and port, and source IP and port, is used to match traffic to the correct socket on a machine. So let's apply these five tuples to our DNS example. In the case of our DNS resolver, we can get UDP and TCP packets for DNS queries. Using our five tuple logic, we know to route the UDP packet to the datagram socket and to route the TCP packet to the streaming socket. So it's fine to bind these two sockets to the same address. Different packets over different protocols will be forwarded to the correct socket at that address. This ability to multiplex different traffic streams on the same port reminds me of AOL a bit. I think this audience is old enough to remember what AOL is, but like honestly, you can never be sure these days. <laughs> Do you remember how your DSL internet and family's landline phone ran on the same telephone line? So your interconne internet connection's Neopets, and your sister's phone call about you being on Neopets too much used totally different frequencies. Now you know a little too much about my childhood. <laughs> Use of these different frequencies ensured that both your internet browsing and your sister's phone call could occur simultaneously. This is like concurrent UDP and TCP packets being on totally different frequencies and reaching their intended distinct sockets. There are more cases where we need to be like AOL and multiplex different traffic streams to the different sockets bound to the same network addresses. This brings me to the bug that inspired this whole talk. When I started at Cloudflare, I had a ticket to deconflict two services running on the same network address. The first service was a secure time protocol server called Rough Time. What you need to know is that it ran on port 2002 and bound to internet address any, as a lot of servers do. The problem is that Rough Time, by binding to all available IPs of a machine, conflicted with another service called Spectrum. Spectrum is a Cloudflare proxy that allows customers to put TCP and UDP services behind Cloudflare's content distribution network. Since Spectrum is a layer four proxy, it must expose a dedicated IP, so requests to a service can proxy through Cloudflare before hitting the customer's service. As a result, it was possible that customers would want to run a UDP service behind Spectrum on port 2002. This means that Cloudflare machines would need to run another service on port 2002 bound to a dedicated IP address. The problem here is that there's already a UDP service, rough time, running on port 2002 for all IPs on that machine. So any attempts to create a UDP service on port 2002 would always fail. You know, rough time would just say, be gone. You can't have this address. It's mine. So sharing is caring, and we need to find a way to fix this. To show you what this port collision error looked like, I have a quick demo. The Go code above creates two datagram sockets for UDP. The first datagram socket acts like rough time. It binds the port 2002 on all of the available IP addresses on that computer. The second datagram socket acts like spectrum. It binds to port 2002 on a specific IP, and in my case, I choose the IPv4 localhost IP address. Each of these datagram sockets handles incoming UDP packets on separate Go routines, so I need to keep the main Go routine running and these sockets exposed 
by doing something hacky and just calling an empty select at the end of this function. So let's see this code in action. So here, the example of rough time application binds to all available IP addresses on port 2002, which includes the IPv4 localhost. As a result, when Spectrum tries to connect to the IPv4 localhost, it can't, and it gets an address already in use error. This is an example of default socket behavior causing collision problems when multiple sockets are bound to the same address. So this is where the world of socket behavior modification through socket options can help us. Socket behavior is modified by using socket options. And there are a lot of socket options out there, but today I'll focus on a commonly used one, um, socket reuse address. I'll just call it reuse address for simplicity. Reuse address enables some conditions where multiple sockets can bind to and share the same address. This socket option is what ultimately fixed the collision problem between rough time and spectrum. The reuse address option works for UDP sockets the following way. Say a UDP socket bound to an internet address, uh, any, on port 2002 uses the reuse address socket option. This, this represents our modified rough time socket. Then assume another UDP socket uses reuse address when binding to the specific localhost address on port 2002. This represents our modified spectrum socket. Instead of seeing an address already in use error, the second spot socket for spectrum can successfully bind because reuse address was used by both sockets. So now let's see how traffic is sent to each socket and handled on different frequencies, so to speak. When reuse address is used for UDP, the way packets are routed to a socket is through the closest match by destination address. A packet addressed to the IPv4 localhost on port 2002 will go to the most specific bound matching socket, which is our socket on the right. But what about the case where a packet doesn't have an exact match to a socket's bound address? Take, for example, this packet destined for the IPv6 localhost on port 2002. Because there is no socket specifically bound to the IPv6 localhost IP, this packet will fall back to the internet address any socket on the left. Now that we've seen how reuse address works for UDP addresses or UDP sockets, let's see how we can use the socket option in Go. Let's revisit our earlier example that caused our port collision and fix it. Here, you can see that the code is mostly the same, except for I've created instances of a struct called listen config. Listen, configs a listen, listen config implements a listen packet function, which takes the configurations in listen config and applies them to the socket that listen packet creates. The net package's listen config struct is what allows us to specify socket options for sockets. This listen config struct must have a control function specified, and this is where the logic for socket option passing gets a little complicated. We won't directly pass in socket options to this control function. Instead, this socket function is specified in the syscall.rawcon argument. So there's one more level of abstraction we must go through to set socket options and go. The syscall package's rawcon interface specifies a function also named control. Confusing, right? whose argument is a callback that accepts a file descriptor as its input. Our argument to this control function will be our callback that sets our socket options. So after some digging, we found the magic place where socket options live. I don't fault you if you found those last few slides challenging to follow. Trust me, I was super confused when I first learned all of this as well. So to make this dependency chain as clear as possible, I've broken it down a little more simply here. The listen packet function, which creates a socket, depends on the behavior specified in the listen config struct's control field. The, listening, the listen config struct's control field depends on the rawcon interface's control function. And finally, 
the invocation of the control function depends on the callback passed into it. And this is the callback where we set socket options. Returning to our code, we see that our listen, listen config structs control field is set to a function called set listener options. So let's take a look at what's in this function. Set listener options function signature matches the one required for the control field in the listen config struct as it should. Set listener options returns the results of calling the raw con arguments control method. Passed into the raw cons control method is a callback that calls syscall.setsock opt int, which is kind of a mouthful. This is the function that we use to set a socket option to our particular integer value. Its arguments are the following. Set sock opt int, that's really a tongue twister, um, takes the file descriptor of the socket, a protocol level where one represents the socket level, our socket option reuse address, and the value the option should be set to, which in this case is one for on. So now you finish the logic for setting a socket option in Go. It's not the most intuitive, but once you get this pattern down, it becomes much easier to replicate and apply this to other socket options in Go. Eagle-eyed folks in this audience, however, might be wondering, isn't the syscall package deprecated? Shouldn't I use the xsys package? Yeah, the syscall package is frozen, but there are still parts of the Go standard library that do depend on this frozen code. The listen config struct, after all, has a callback that must have the syscall.rockcon interface as an argument. The xsys package, however, can be used to, so to surface operating system, system specific constants and socket options, as well as OS specific syscalls for setting socket options. The xsys package is good for encouraging gophers to be explicit about which operating systems their socket code targets. This is useful given that different operating systems, like Unix-based ones versus Windows, can have totally different sets of socket options. Xsys is still actively updated, meaning that newer socket options will also be available on it. Here we use the Xsys Unix package to ensure that the socket logic that we're using and the socket option that we've chosen targets Unix-based systems. So now that we're done writing code that allows us to pass in the reuse address socket option, let's see if it fixes our UDP socket collision issue. Let's first start our server. So we're running go run main.go. We can observe that our rough time socket can successfully bind to internet address any, and our spectrum socket can successfully bind to our IPv4 localhost. Next, I use ncat to send UDP packets to the IPv4 localhost on port 2002. So let's see if it goes to Spectrum, and it does. As expected, this packet goes to the Spectrum socket, which is specifically bound to this IP address. Very nice. <laughs> um, so I'll also use ncat to send UDP packets to another address, the IPv6 localhost on port 2002. Since there's no socket specifically bound to this IP address, this packet falls back to our rough time socket bound on internet address any. And we see that it correctly makes it to the rough time socket and we get our echo back from that as well. So through this demo, we see that by using the reuse address socket option, our server no longer gets address already in use errors and that UDP packets are routed to the correct endpoints as expected. I think this demo really only scratches the surface of really cool things you can do with socket options. And the Cloudflare blog has plenty more examples of cool use cases. I've seen my uh, colleagues use socket options for load balancing purposes, connection accept queues, and even packet filtering through BPF, which is really cool. And if you want to read more about so applications of socket options in depth, I recommend checking out our blog where we write a lot about our escapades with them. And I mean, we really, really love socket options. A lot. <laughs> After all, there are a lot of fish or socket options in the sea. And I hope today's talk equipped you with the knowledge of what sockets are and how to use them in Go.
I also hope that you've learned how to use socket options in Go to build advanced networking applications. And most of all, I hope you feel empowered to go forth and explore cool, low-level networking applications using sockets and socket options. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me in person or tweet them to me. I'll make sure to act them. And thank you so much for coming to my talk today.